Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I'm very happy to do you stand in this house and the member from Shozel said if I require water, he'll be assisting me and he'll be providing me water it shows. And I think we had a conversation, a sidebar, where we agreed that we should have a government of unity. And I'm happy that he has subscribed, he has subscribed to this idea. And Mr. Speaker, you know every time we convene a sitting of this parliament and I rise in this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, I make a deliberate attempt to remind myself that I am here at the mercy and at the BS of the people of Mikunov. I remind myself, Mr. Speaker, that I am able to stand here in this house because I listen to the people of Mikunov. I noted their challenges, their concerns, and Mr. Speaker, I promise to do my best as their representative to allay their fears and tackle some of the issues which poses a challenge for them. I also promise, Mr. Speaker, to give voice to their concerns when I stand in this house and to do my best to implement some of the projects which they deem important for the constituency. I also attribute part of my presence here, Mr. Speaker, to the way in which I carry myself, <coughs> my comportment, my deportment. And I know that when most people from Mikudnov went to the polls on that faithful day of July 2021, they went there knowing, Mr. Speaker, and expecting that I would carry myself with the highest level of professionalism. They went there expecting me to carry myself with a certain level of respect. And I remind myself of that, Mr. Speaker, because I'm not just representing Jeremiah no, but the individual. I'm representing a constituency. I'm representing persons with disabilities. I'm representing the youth, especially the marginalized and the vulnerable. And I know, Mr. Speaker, you're probably thinking, where is he going with all of this? But I think, Mr. Speaker, it is very important, and I stress very important, Mr. Speaker, for me to start off my presentation today by publicly denouncing the shameful and bitter behavior of the former representative for Grozili at the UWP meeting or convention which was held at the Sufre bus terminal a few weeks ago, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've always made the point when I stand in this house, I've always made the point that there is a need for an opposition. An opposition is supposed to behave or act as a government in waiting. An opposition has a responsibility to call on the government it has a responsibility to call on the government of the day if it believes that the government is doing an injustice to the people. Whether through what, sometimes you, they may not agree with maybe certain tax regimes. Maybe they believe that access to health is not equitable. Education for the citizenry is not accessible. Just because these are the issues that you expect the opposition to stand on and debate. An opposition is supposed to offer better alternatives if they think that they have better alternatives to what the government is offering. And these are the tenets upon which a good opposition operates. And I solemnly believe, Mr. Speaker, that the populace may be a lot more receptive to an opposition which embraces these tenets and uses them as the foundation upon which they build their structure. But when you have nothing to criticize, you have nothing to criticize the government on, you cannot look at the policies of the government and dissect them and accurately criticize them, but you choose to go to the gutter. You choose to probe supporters into casting insulting remarks at the Honorable Prime Minister. And Mr. Speaker, need I not remind you that we live in a time of technology where when you say something now, within minutes it spreads like wildfires all over the world. But you choose to probe your supporters into casting insulting remarks at the Honorable Prime Minister. And when you did it once, as if it was not enough, Mr. Speaker, you repeated the statement and you encouraged supporters to insult the Prime Minister again. I say shame on you. Shame on you, former parliamentary representative for Grozili. And to make it worse, to make it worse, Mr. Speaker, I did not hear one member of that party openly reject that type of behavior. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, you could have seen some cheering and giggling in the background when the statement was made. And sometimes, Mr. Speaker, we ask, 
Why, why has the social fabric in this country deteriorated so badly? We ask, why have we become such a violent nation, such a violent people? One of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, is because of what we witnessed in Sufra a few weeks ago. We as leaders, Mr. Speaker, and when I say leaders, I'm not excluding anyone here, you know, Mr. Speaker. We as leaders, the people have entrusted each and every one of us here today with a responsibility to lead them. And we have a lot of power, Mr. Speaker, as politicians. We have a lot of power. We have a responsibility to lead the flock who have entrusted us to do so. We have a responsibility to be role models for the next generations of leaders. That is our responsibility. They look up to us. We have a responsibility to steer the ship to safety. But we deliberately dig holes in the ship. Yeah? What do you expect if you dig holes in the ship? It must sink. But it will not sink. It will not sink. And we point fingers at everyone except ourselves. We want to blame everyone for what is happening, for the situation that we have in crime. But Mr. Speaker, I commend the member for Castries East. And I commend him for not giving in to the cheap tactics of these individuals. And with every day that passed, Mr. Speaker, and I say that with a sense of pride, I feel more and more grateful that this is a man whom God has chosen to lead this team and this country. A man who does not believe in getting into the gutter. A man who does not believe that he needs to get even. And Mr. Speaker, instead of encouraging us to respond to what happened in Sufre, you know what he did? He advised us to never allow politics to bring us so low. To never allow the hunger and thirst for power to cause us to attack person's character. And I promise him that I will keep this piece of advice wherever I roam. And Mr. Speaker, I think it is important that, it's important that I say part of this in Creole so that everybody understands, Mr. Speaker, because I think this message needs to reach everyone in St. Lucia. And I know, Mr. Speaker, I think I can say here confidently that the people of St. Lucia, most people in St. Lucia, even the supporters of the United Workers Party, Mr. Speaker, I know that they were not happy with the behavior of the former parliamentarian. And I feel sorry for those who are out there shouting whatever it is that they were shouting. And that is why I said we have to understand as leaders we have a lot of power and we have a responsibility to ensure that we lead people in the right direction. Je vais commencer aujourd'hui et puis je vais dire que, as a jeune politicien, as a jeune homme qui veut un pays qui veut aller devant, qui veut un différent qualité politique en dit de cette liste, c'est que c'était une honteuse pour ça qui était fait. Il y en avait des dimanches passés à souffrir. Les membres parlement pour Gozile, pas ça à présent, même pas le mois avant pour Gozile. <laughs> Ou était à sous la plateforme. Et puis il a dit, c'est mon nom. Il a crowd là. Et bien il a demandé, il a fait bagay pour faire yo dit, et bien pour prier premier ministre cette liste. Ah non. Et moi je voulais dire à tout le monde. Nous savons nous avons été de temps avant nous faire bagay ça tout partout. A mon n'a pas n'importe tout, à mon n'a pas une vidéo et ça tout partout, tout phone, tout computer ça a sous. Et puis nous mandé qu'on nous qui manière nous vivre qu'on nous y odia. Qui manière nous vivre dans la société qu'on la nuit autant crime qu'on moun pas qu'à moutier l'amitié encore. Et mais dis-le nous qu'à mandé qu'on nous c'est quoi ça? Nous pouvons ça qui était fait dès dimanche qui passé et puis. Nous avons joué un réponse là. Nous avons une responsabilité à ce politicien et je voulais encourager tous les collègues ici à Rodia pour prendre une responsabilité à la série. Nous avons une responsabilité pour nous dire que tout le monde s'est ici qui a gardé nous, que nous vivons de manière, nous avons quitté l'exemple de la jeunesse qui a gardé nous, nous avons quitté l'exemple. Par l'autre monde qui a gardé nous, qui mettait nous en dehors de l'office de nous, il est Et puis, je voulais discourager tous les politiciens ici à Jodia, pas juste ça qui est opposition, pour ne pas jamais descendre chez nous. Pas jamais quitter le pouvoir. 
Mais nous avons des position pour cacher les dates pour insulter les gens. Pour que les gens ne pas plus chaud. Et puis, ça qui a fait mes plus la peine de tout ça, la tenir chez l'autre monde là. Et puis, ce monde pas dit, et bien, il n'y a pas de à la TV, et bien, il n'y a pas de la Même si vous ne voulez pas dire ça, il n'y a pas de la TV. Et si je veux que moi, là, ça veut dire que 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 ça veut Et puis, on a une responsabilité, si vous ne pas d'accord, même si vous ne pas venir, là, et que vous ne voulez pas faire ça, pas dire ça, on a une responsabilité. Et après, et moi, tout le monde qui a accepté ça avec d'accord, l'anlè, nous avons fait mystique. Et que l'anlè, nous avons dit, nous sommes nommés, avec mystique qui a fait, mais nous avons d'accord, nous faisons mystique et que nous avons fait Mais pièce, nous ne pas dit rien. Et que moi, je pour mine, je dis en anglais, silence is consent. Et que si vous ne dites rien, je pour dire ou d'accord, et puis ça, qui est fait à ce plateforme-là. Anyways, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to spend any more time um, on what happened in Soufre because on Tuesday we listened to the member for caste resist and we listened to him deliver the policy direction of this administration for the financial year 2023-2024 and there was so much good coming from this Mr. Speaker usually I spend maybe half an hour to 45 minutes on my feet um, but today I think I may utilize my full hour, but I still felt the need, Mr. Speaker, that as a young politician, as someone who usually engages with other young enthusiasts, it was necessary to voice their concern about what happened in Soufre and to let it be known that we do not support this type of behavior. And I cannot even say this type of politics, Mr. Speaker, because I'm not sure that this can even pass as politics. And we would like to see more substance and less baseless arguments, Mr. Speaker, from the people who have assumed or those who assume the highest office or some of the highest offices in this land. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to start my presentation by thanking the men, the women, and the children of Mikudnov, Mr. Speaker. And I always have to thank the children because every time I stand here, I remember them singing Jerry Maya. And Mr. Speaker, you know, <laughs> sometimes you sit and you reflect and, and these children played a very critical role. I remember parents asking their children to go inside because despite their political affiliation being on the other side, the children would come outside with their flags, nonetheless waving. They would come singing. And I also thank um, Owen Charles for this lovely song that he put together, Bofelili Bofelo, um, during the election campaign. <laughs> I thank the people of Mikud North, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to be able to make representation on their behalf in this August chamber. And I'll continue to put my best foot forward, Mr. Speaker. No pun intended, I see the member for Denry North is already watching, Mr. Speaker. I intend to put my best foot forward and I will continue to strive to represent you with utmost distinction. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, I would like to comment on some of the general policies and the policy intention of this government for this financial year. And then I will look at some of the policies specific to my constituency, Miku North. Mr. Speaker, this budget has been premised on the theme health and security, the pillars for sustainability. And given the recent setbacks brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Speaker, and the negative impact of the violent crimes which started to surface in our beautiful country, I think the focus is perfect given the current circumstances. In general, this budget speaks to investing in our health infrastructure, whilst at the same time ensuring that we create a health system that is responsive, a health system, Mr. Speaker, that is affordable, one that is accessible, and one that is also equitable. This year's budget also speaks to making a deliberate effort, Mr. Speaker, to combat crime, and in the words of the Prime Minister, We should not allow the soils of crime to get fertile in this land. And notwithstanding the first and emphasis placed on these two sectors, this budget also creates a much more enabling and comfortable environment for the marginalized and the vulnerable people of St. Lucia. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, this budget is really taking into consideration the needs of the people of St. Lucia. Not the needs of a few elite people, but the needs of all St. Lucians. And I did not expect anything else from the maestro, the leader and the member for Castries East. Most of the men, Mr. Speaker, and the women, and I know the member for Castries East constantly reminds us of this. Most of the men and the women who forms this administration are the children of ordinary people and have lived ordinary lives and have walked the paths of most St. Lucians and we speak the language of most St. Lucians. So it is natural, Mr. Speaker, there is no magic there. It is natural for us and for them to relate to the struggles of most St. Lucians. And because of this relatability, we are able to put measures in place to help our fellow St. Lucian men and women. Mr. Speaker, the safety and the security of our citizenry have come under tremendous threat. Over the past few years, and even the situation has worsened in the past months, we have continued to see an increase in crime, especially violent crime. Mr. Speaker, crime is a very complex phenomenon. But we should never fear complexity. For complexity is simply many simple things which were probably left unaddressed, Mr. Speaker, and was allowed to mushroom into something that we deemed complex. And we need to look at all the little things which contribute to crime and criminality. We need to look at the socialization aspect of our people. We need to also take into consideration the parenting component. We need to look at the educational component. Consider the economic environment under which crimes, crime flourishes, Mr. Speaker. And then we have to look at the crime fighting agencies like the police, our rehabilitative institutions like probation and parole department. And we have to take into consideration the conditions at the prisons. And we have to ask ourselves, are these agencies and institutions really functioning the way in which they are supposed to? And Mr. Speaker, I think it is fair to say, or it is an honest opinion when we say that we have identified several gaps within some of the institutions. And these gaps, they require closing and they require closing now in order for us to come out of where we are. And that is the reason we have always given expression, Mr. Speaker, to the fact that the only way to really address crime is to adopt a multifaceted approach. We need to stop politicizing crime. We need to stop using crime as a means of scoring cheap political points. We need to, as a people, Mr. Speaker, and as a government, and when I say government, I'm referring to both the incumbent and members opposite, Mr. Speaker. I say we all have a part to f play in this fight against crime. Because, Mr. Speaker, the negative, let's face it, the negative and pervasive effects of crime does not discriminate against class, it does not discriminate against race, it does not discriminate against color or political affiliation. And you think when a man says that he wants to go and kill another man, he asks himself whether the man black, white, brown, blue, labor, flabo, I will not kill me because he's a labor, I'll not kill me because he's a flabo. Mr. Speaker, these are not considerations when people think of partaking in crime and criminal activity. We all feel and we all suffer the negative consequences of crime. And it is on that note, Mr. Speaker, that I am pleased with the pronouncement by the Prime Minister on page 28 of his presentation when he said, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, in my show of commitment to this cause, I wish to inform you, members of this House and the St. Lucian public, that I, we lead the battle against crime without fear, favor, or partisan thinking until the scourge of criminality is no more. And I invite my colleagues and civil society to join me in this battle. Mr. Speaker, this is a man who understands that he does not have all the answers and that it requires an all hands on deck approach to effectively fight crime in this country. And I want to assure the member for Caspis is that he has my full support and commitment in this fight against crime. We are in this together. Mr. Speaker, this administration has been bold and this administration has been decisive and has shown up, Mr. Speaker, when called upon to deal with this crime situation. 
our actions and our initiatives, Mr. Speaker, over the course of the last year speaks clearly to the commitment of this government to dealing with this crime situation. Mr. Speaker, it has not been easy. The crime fighting journey has not come without obstacles. But we continue to persevere. We continue to work because we really cannot attach any price tag to the safety and security of our St. Lucian people. We have taken actions, Mr. Speaker, which politically may have seemed unfavorable or unpopular at the time. But we took them, Mr. Speaker, we took these actions because they were necessary and we placed more value on the lives of the people than on our own political existence. And that is what real leaders do, Mr. Speaker. We place more value on the lives of the ordinary man and woman in St. Lucia than we do on our own political existence. And if it means, Mr. Speaker, that the actions that we take to ensure that you can walk safely in St. Lucia, that you can move around without having to look, at your, look behind you, or worrying what is around you, Mr. Speaker. If it means that the actions that we have to take to ensure that this happens cause us to lose an election, then so be it, Mr. Speaker. Because as I said, we place a lot more emphasis on the lives of our people than we do on our own political existence. Mr. Speaker, at the legislative level, we have increased the penalties for illegal firearm possession and ammunition. We have enacted the suppression of Escalated Crime Police Powers Act, and we have created a Serious Crimes Unit. And Mr. Speaker, these are important measures given what we are faced with currently. But Mr. Speaker, remember I said, every one of us has a part to play in this fight against crime. And I don't want to take a swipe, but I want to encourage the judiciary, mem members of the judiciary, Mr. Speaker, to also play their role in this fight against crime. Mr. Speaker, I think it is unfair to all of us here who come to this house, we pass laws, and to feel as if the laws are being ignored deliberately or otherwise, Mr. Speaker. The penalties for certain offenses were increased or intensified because we saw that the former ones were not achieving the objective. Penalties are supposed to serve as deterrence, Mr. Speaker. And it's supposed to serve as deterrence to persons who want to engage in criminality. Crime should not be affordable. And this is because sometimes when we hear what is happening and we look at what is happening on the ground, I think we've, been, we, we've started treating crime and criminality like a commodity. And persons know that I just need to put my five or $10,000 on the side and I can hold my gun. And if police hold me, I'm going to just get my $5 and $10,000 to pay bill. And the most I'll spend is maybe three days inside. And then when I go, I make bill and I come out. Now, if crime becomes affordable, Mr. Speaker, and we start treating it like a, a commodity, then we're not going to get that breakthrough that we are looking for. We are not going to achieve the objectives that we set out to achieve, Mr. Speaker. And when the government comes together, Mr. Speaker, and takes a decision, I think that the judiciary also has a responsibility to play their role and ensure that the laws are applied. Because what you find happening, Mr. Speaker, is that there is a, a, a benchmark that gives you a cap. I think initially when we passed at the initial, before we came here to this house to change, to make amendments to the um, Firearms Act, there was a $15,000 cap. Mr. Speaker, we amended that, and I think right now um, the judiciary has the discretion to place bill at much higher levels, maybe $50,000 or even more, Mr. Speaker. Um, but we still see a lot of situations, or most situations, Mr. Speaker, where persons are found with firearms and the following day or two days later, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's also unfair to the police because the police put their lives on the line day in and day out. And they have to witness persons who have been caught with illegal firearms be granted bills in terms that we can call maybe slaps on the wrist, Mr. Speaker. And in order for our society to function properly, all arms of government need to ensure that they carry out their various functions effectively. And Mr. Speaker, I will say that in Creole. 
Mais je explique que nous venons ici avec le gouvernement, avec le Parlement, avec nous venons de la CAISA, avec nous qui avons la loi. Nous avons passé la loi pour une raison. Nous avons passé la loi parce que c'est la loi qui était là. Nous avons faire changement pour la loi. Nous avons passé ces changements parce que c'est la loi qui était là avant. Nous n'avons pas fait ça et nous avons mis la loi pour faire. So, nous avons passé la loi pour faire à des choses plus ouais, et bien nous avons fait ces ces pénalités là plus ouais. Mais mes expliquer nous avons un gouvernement, nous pas ça fait toute bagay. Les nous venons ici, nous avons un parlement, les nous venons ici avec nous passer loi, il cadre bout là et puis nous et puis là nous monte qui nous responsabilité, ça nous a pu un judiciaire nous a responsabilité pour la ces lois ça là nous a passé à des deux cas constitue ces lois ça y a point et y a servi y mais dès là nous avons une situation pour nous faire même si nous faisons changement de loi la nissa a créé discretionary power et qui a servi ça y a servi um, discretionary power yo pour <coughs> les y a um, um, fait jugement et bien les y a fait bill bah c'est mona y a chebia et puis nous voulons que les tout le monde pour faire ça y a employé pour faire tout le monde y a responsabilité nous tout le responsabilité un combat ça against crime et que je voulais encourager tout le monde pour jouer partout à l'idée de combattre ça. Monsieur le Speaker, still on security of our people. The main agencies charged with dealing with the hard elements of crime, Mr. Speaker, they need an enabling environment for them to be able to operate effectively. And it is the responsibility of the government, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the working environment is conducive and that it allows for workers to deliver and dispatch their duties diligently. And there is no question as to whether there is a direct correlation between the working conditions and productivity. Over the past years, the police and prison officers have had to endure some questionable working conditions, Mr. Speaker. I know because I was there. I know because I too endured some of these conditions. <coughs> But believe it or not, Mr. Speaker, The police have been reluctant to arrest individuals. And they have been reluctant to arrest individuals, especially in the city basin, Mr. Speaker, because they do not have a proper holding facility to house these prisoners. They have tried their best to utilize various stations. They go to Masha, Babuno, Ancillary, Marigo, And at times, I think, even made use of the city police holding facility, Mr. Speaker. And sometimes, Mr. Speaker, they have to go as far as Denry and Miku to be able to house prisoners. So let's just think about it, Mr. Speaker. You're sending a driver, and usually there is only one driver on the shift, and at least two other police officers, and we know that the shift is already slim, so you're sending three individuals to escort a prisoner to the enemy. Now, while they're on their way, something happens in the city. But they cannot turn, they cannot come back because they have a prisoner with them. Now, what if they return from that journey, Mr. Speaker, two hours later, and someone else commits an offense and has to be arrested? Mr. Speaker, I think you can envisage how the productivity of the police is being affected by them not having a custody suite. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy that on page 54 of the budget that the Prime Minister has announced that a design finance contract of $4.2 million has been awarded for the conversion of the old police headquarters building for the custody suites. And this is a project which is long overdue, Mr. Speaker, and a project which will go a long way in enhancing the productivity level of law enforcement agencies. And we know that an increase in productivity levels of law enforcement agencies will automatically lead to an increase in citizenry security and public trust and public confidence in the police. So this is just one of the measures, Mr. Speaker, that this year's budget will also allow for much needed improvement and rehabilitation to various police stations around the island. On, in, on, on page 30, Mr. Speaker, I saw that there will be repairs to the Southern Divisional Headquarters. And I know that the officers in the South will welcome this because, Mr. Speaker, they've had to deal with some working conditions which only your passion and your drive and your commitment 
can cause you to go to work, you know, Mr. Speaker. Not the working conditions, but yet still they continue to endure. And I applaud and commend the officers in the South, Mr. Speaker, for continuing to go to work, knowing full well that the conditions are not appropriate for work. And Mr. Speaker, I believe deep down in my heart that most other civil servants would have already left that building if they were faced with the situation that the officers in the South had to deal with. So we thank them for their patience, Mr. Speaker. And although when we think how the station, our station, Mr. Speaker, which required minimal intervention, minimal repairs, Mr. Speaker, was allowed to dilapidate. So it begs the question, where was the priority of the then government, Mr. Speaker? Because I think at the time, a $300,000 fix was required, Mr. Speaker. And today it is costing us in excess of $2 million more to rehabilitate the Vifort Police Station. Now, I know that the former administration wanted to do some things in Vifort, but it was just not for the police station. Maybe the priority then were maybe horses, Mr. Speaker, maybe land, maybe, but it was not the police. And on page 53, mention is made of a new police divisional headquarters along a northern police divisional headquarters. And I know that the member for Grosile has been agitating and advocating for the commencement. And I'm happy, Mr. Speaker, that we have the Prime Minister announced that work has already commenced at the new Northern Divisional Headquarters, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Grosile is considered the economic hub of St. Lucia, and it is expected that the establishment of this new headquarters will go a long way in providing a conducive environment for the officers in the North, and also improve the safety and security of persons who live, work, and play in Grosile. Mr. Speaker, repairs are also going to be made to Canaries. Mikud, Mr. Speaker. And I say Mikud, Mr. Speaker, rich for and Marsha. And I have to say Mikud, Mr. Speaker, because, and I want to take the opportunity, I want Hansa to show me publicly applauding, Mr. Speaker, and bigging up the men and women who occupy the Mikud police station. Mr. Speaker, not too long ago, the conditions at the Mikud police station was deemed unfit and unsafe for human inhabitation. And there were serious problems with the air quality there. Mr. Speaker, the officers had to resort to working on the tent. And not just on the tent, you know, Mr. Speaker. A tent with no sides, just a roof. So they were exposed to the elements. You could pass at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and they were there working. Rain, sun, whatever, Mr. Speaker. Hurricane, they were working. Mr. Speaker, the security and safety of these officers were compromised because right now they're just exposed not just to the elements, but anybody now from the main road could have chosen to make these officers a target. And they knew that, Mr. Speaker. And knowing that, they decided to still go because the desire to see things change in this country, Mr. Speaker, is much bigger than their own needs. And I applaud the men and women of the Mikud Police Station, Mr. Speaker, for, and this speaks to their commitment and by extension, the commitment of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. And we usually chastise the police, Mr. Speaker. We usually, when we get a chance, we take a swipe at the police, we chastise them when they fall short. And even make memes about them, Mr. Speaker. Not too long ago, I saw a meme going around some traffic matter, Mr. Speaker. And little times do we give them the praise and recognition which they truly deserve. And as a government, Mr. Speaker, we need to do our best to ensure that we provide them with all the support that they need. And this is why I'm happy, Mr. Speaker, that this year's budget, I see there is support for the police. Also on page 30, I see that the police will be receiving new vehicles, Mr. Speaker, or should I say more new vehicles? Because I knew that they received a complement of vehicles already. I see the police will also receive in trucks, bicycles, special police equipment like drones, x-ray machines, bulletproof vests, and ammunition. And I want to emphasize the importance of the bulletproof vests, Mr. Speaker, especially given what is happening and the spate of gun violence in this country. And our police officers go out there knowing full well that they may not go back home and they continue to go. So be, to be able to ensure that in the policy direction of this government, that an allocation was made to ensure that these police officers receive some sort of protective gear, Mr. Speaker. I think this speaks volume of the government and what we think of our police officers.
Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt that this year's budget is making a concerted effort towards improving the general security and of our citizenry. Arresting individuals who commit crime is one thing. Having the system and proper structure to deal with them thereafter is another. But on page 31, the Prime Minister alluded to the SWIFT Justice Project, Mr. Speaker. A project, if executed well, can help significantly reduce the processing time for court cases and can help deal with this backlog that we have had for decades now, Mr. Speaker, of cases. And Mr. Speaker, we know the saying, justice denied or justice delayed is justice denied. And when persons have had matters before the court, anyone who has had a matter before the court, Mr. Speaker, they can tell you how frustrating it can get when you have to forego a day's work, you forego a day's work to attend court, and then the matter is adjourned, and then you go again and it's adjourned. On 10 occasions, the matter is adjourned, and sometimes you find people just abandoned altogether, and justice is denied because of the frustrating process that we have. So I'm happy, Mr. Speaker, that the injection of $2 million is being put towards this initiative this year. And we are hoping to see this project fully operational during this financial year. Mr. Speaker, the key element to the successful prosecution of any matter is having witnesses. And there is no doubt that people see and hear everything. People see and hear everything which happens in St. Lucia. But they will tell you for fear of being a victim, see no evil, hear no evil, do no evil. And that is the approach which they've adopted. This year, the government is expanding the witness protection program, thereby creating a more comfortable environment, Mr. Speaker, for persons who have witnessed crimes and genuinely want to come forward. Because I know that there are persons who genuinely want to come forward, who genuinely want to see a difference. However, Mr. Speaker, for fear of them becoming victims, they've decided to take a back seat. But this year, through the expansion of the witness program, the witness protection program, Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping to see more people come forward and to be able to work in collaboration with the police. And Mr. Speaker, when someone is now successfully prosecuted and is being incarcerated, we need to ensure that we have the necessary structure to be able to provide them with the proper rehabilitation so that the transition, Mr. Speaker, from crime to rehabilitation is a smooth one. Only with a proper rehabilitation machinery, Mr. Speaker, will we see the rate of recidivism reduce. And I'm happy that we'll be witnessing an increase, Mr. Speaker, again in, the, in parole officers. Though not sufficient, Mr. Speaker, in my opinion, given the amount of task in front of us, we will be seeing improvements to the Borderly Correctional Facility. And Mr. Speaker, all the measures I mentioned are reactive measures to deal with crime. And I think the Prime Minister captured it well when he said that, yes, we're putting in place a lot of measures to deal with crime after it has happened. And these measures are very important, given the fact that crime is inevitable. So you have to put measures in place to deal with crime when it happens. However, Mr. Speaker, equally important are, measures, are the measures that we take to ensure that crime does not permeate through our society and the steps we take to ensure that we create that type of anti-crime culture in our society. We need to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we put measures in place to safeguard our next generation and ensure that our people are socialized in such a way that they start to naturally reject the notion of crime, the whole idea of crime. And Mr. Speaker, this budget addresses aspects of this. Community-based organizations, violent interruption groups, faith-based organizations, and civil society, Mr. Speaker, in general, plays an integral role in nipping crime in the bud. And there are several issues which contribute to crime. Poverty, poor housing, school dropouts, lack of places to recreate, and not enough emphasis placed on dealing with the psychosocial aspect of development of our young people. And I know, Mr. Speaker, because I remember myself growing up, and I'm thankful that I did not fall in the cracks. Yes, and I see the member from Castries South opens his eyes, Mr. Speaker. My, my childhood, Mr. Speaker, was not the best. I know that <coughs> given what... what <laughs> And I know, Mr. Speaker, that um, there are persons who looked at me growing up and they expected that I was going to fall 
somewhere between the cracks and that I was not going to be where I am today. And I had this, but I had the support of my mother, Mr. Speaker. I had the support of my community. I was guided by the men and women of the 4-H club then, Mr. Speaker. I was sent to church and I received guidance and counseling at the church. My principals, Mr. Speaker, and teachers were never fearful of dealing with me when I fell short. But we have lost some of these key factors, Mr. Speaker. Some of these key factors which plays a very important role in ensuring that the young men and women do not adopt a life of crime and criminality. And we have to revisit some of these measures, Mr. Speaker. Whilst adopting new measures, and I notice that, yes, the school also plays a very integral role. And that's why I said, once upon a time, your teachers and principals were not fearful of dealing with you if you had to stretch out your hands and take five strokes. But it kept you on track. Now, I'm not saying that this is a, I know the member for Denry North may have a different view, given his, he, the fact that he is responsible for education. But Mr. Speaker, I think these, these little things played a very important role in creating a society where people were fearful of being ill, disciplined. A society where people knew that if you did wrong, anybody could have hold you and cut your tail for you. So people were not so emboldened, Mr. Speaker, because they knew that they were going to be dealt with one way or the other. But right now, we, we have a society, we've seen serious decay in that social fabric, Mr. Speaker. And it's really, and we're paying the price for it. And I said, sometimes we ask, how did we get here? And some of us have to take responsibility for where we are today, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy that there has been a crime prevention. I was particularly pleased with the mention of a crime prevention office, which would have the responsibility for coordinating crime reduction, crime prevention, and intervention programs initiated by civil society groups, non-governmental organizations, and government agencies. And Mr. Speaker, I have been intimately involved in this initiative, and we are moving full steam ahead in putting this office together. And as a matter of fact, I think this morning, Mr. Speaker, they would have met and had some discussions as to the best way to implement this initiative. Mr. Speaker, I spent a lot of time about speaking about the safety and security of our people, and I had to do so, Mr. Speaker, based on what we have been witnessing happening in our little beautiful island, St. Lucia. And as a former police officer, Mr. Speaker, the situation really concerned me, and I'm really elate, elated that time, attention, and resources, Mr. Speaker, will be channeled towards that sector. We know that these measures alone, Mr. Speaker, will not solve all our problems. But I look forward to some of these projects being implemented and some of these initiatives taking off, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, health is the other pillar of sustainability mentioned in the theme of this year's budget. But I will not say anything much on this topic because I know that the member for Viewfort North will speak extensively, Mr. Speaker, on health. But I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, that myself and the people of Mikud North and the people of the South, Mr. Speaker, we were very happy to know that work is ongoing at St. Jude's, Mr. Speaker, as we speak. And soon, and very soon, we will be able to receive medical care at this institution. Mr. Speaker, I will now touch on some of the policy measures which has either direct benefits or implications for the people of Mikunov. And I will start with education. <laughs> Why did I ask you to give a <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will start with education. The government pronouncement, Mr. Speaker, to continue along with its mandate to produce one university graduate per household and continue to increase the availability of scholarships on page 19, Mr. Speaker. This initiative is well received by the people of Mikud North. And I can proudly say that, Mr. Speaker, that in excess of 12 individuals from Mikud North were recipients of scholarships from the government during the last financial year. And I look forward, Mr. Speaker, to this number, and I hope that the member for Denry North is paying attention, Mr. Speaker. I'm looking forward to this number growing even bigger during this financial year. <laughs> member for Denry North. I can proudly say that in excess of 12 individuals from Mikud North 
were recipients of scholarships from the government during the last financial year. And I look forward, Mr. Speaker, to this number growing, multiplying three, four, five, six, sevenfold, Mr. Speaker, during this financial year. I want to continue to encourage persons from my constituency, Mr. Speaker, who meet the requirements to continue to take advantage of these scholarship opportunities. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> it would be remiss of me not to mention the revolutionary youth economy, given the fact that I may be the only parliamentarian in this house, Mr. Speaker, who is still considered or is still qualified as youth. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I know that there are many people who wish that they were still youth or they could have used youth as an adjective, but <laughs> yeah. The youth don't usually go to the library, senior. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the youth economy has officially opened its doors and have started processing applications. And there are quite a few individuals in Miku North, Mr. Speaker, who have ideas and skills that they would love to turn into entrepreneurship opportunities. And the youth economy provides the opportunity to realize that dream. Providing a space that is specific to the needs of young people, Mr. Speaker, is commendable. But we need to start thinking of how, Mr. Speaker, probably we can decentralize the operations of the agency so that they can meet the youth in their spaces, meet them at their levels, Mr. Speaker, so that individuals from rural areas, like my constituency, Mr. Speaker, don't feel disadvantaged. I know some may argue, Mr. Speaker, that we are living in an age of technology and making the agency available online is providing access. But we cannot deny the fact that there is still a problem, Mr. Speaker, with digital divide and with general digital literacy among our young people. So moving forward, I think the agency can have probably regular outreach sessions, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that there is equal opportunity for all, notwithstanding their geographical locations. And it will go a long way in ensuring that there is equitable distribution of the state resources, Mr. Speaker. I also notice a slight disparity, Mr. Speaker, in the applications received and those processed, or even those where reviews and consultations were arranged. And I recommend that within the agency, Mr. Speaker, we have a component that deals with helping those persons who did not meet the requirements or who did not qualify um, for the loan or grant through a graduation process, Mr. Speaker, where probably eventually they benefit from the program after graduating, or even pair them, Mr. Speaker, with some persons who have been successful in obtaining assistance from the agency. But apart from that, Mr. Speaker, I think that this policy direction of this administration speaks volumes to how we think of our young people and we believe in giving opportunities to our young people. And we have the, the St. Lucia Labour Party and this administration, the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party has always had a track record for ensuring that we cater to the needs of the young people in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, I now move on to the Community Tourism Initiative. This initiative, Mr. Speaker, is geared towards providing visitors, Mr. Speaker, with a more authentic experience when they visit our shores, when they visit our lands, with doing away, if not doing away, Mr. Speaker, but giving you opportunity to do both the resort and the community experience. So you'd be able to get a real taste, a true taste of St. Lucia. If you think of Mr. Speaker, when you go to a resort, most resorts offer most times the same things, Mr. Speaker. You go down for breakfast and the breakfast is the same everywhere. Most times the English breakfast here and you know Mr. Speaker, but be able to go down to Miku, Mr. Speaker. If you're able to go down to Miku, Mr. Speaker, and get a nice aqua there in the morning, Mr. Speaker, a nice cocoa tea. And you know we have the rural women who produce the best cocoa in Miku North, Mr. Speaker. And to be able to get <laughs> to be able to get an authentic Miku breakfast, Mr. Speaker. We have a little map of St. Lucia at Point Verge, Mr. Speaker. And to be able to experience these things firsthand, Mr. Speaker. I think this initiative is going to go a long way. And by doing that, Mr. Speaker, what it will, this initiative will also empower the people within our local economy, providing local people, providing St. Lucian people with loans and grants to be able to establish their touristic businesses, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, you know what is of significant importance about this community tourism initiative, Mr. Speaker, to the people of Mikunov, is the fact that for the first time, Mr. Speaker, Communities like Mikud, which were not initially included in the pilot project, will be receiving support. Mr. Speaker, I say that again. Communities like Mikud, which were initially not included in the pilot project, Mr. Speaker, 
they will be we will be receiving support and will benefit from the sum of US three million dollars which the agency is seeking from the CARICOM Development Fund CDF. I have mentioned Prale and the CMOS experience in Prale um, in previous presentations, Mr. Speaker. And this is one of the projects once conceptualized, once the conceptualization process is over, it will be a product of the Community Tourism Initiative. Mr. Speaker, I now go on to land rationalization and housing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I noticed that. Member for Miku North and Deputy Speaker, you have 10 minutes left, and since you place it on the record that there was a yes. memorandum of understanding of a national unity government between you and the member for Suzel, <laughs> and I noticed he did not give you the water, is that broken already? <laughs> <laughs> Member for Suzel. Mr. Speaker, I would like to invoke Senate Order 3210 to ask for an additional 15 minutes for the member to conclude his presentation. Uh, it, it would appear that the national unity government is alive and well. On the members, the question is that Standing Order 3210 be invoked to allow another what, 15? 15. To allow the member for Miku North an additional 15 minutes in which to conclude his presentation. I now put the question as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Thank you, member, for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, member, for Shuzel. Mr. Speaker, I mean, I, I think we can say, I don't want to, to, you know, okay, he says don't say it, Mr. Speaker. I really like the member, I like the member for Shozel, Mr. Speaker. No, no, I'm serious. I really like the member for Shozel. I believe that um, I can speak, I can speak to the member for Shozel and have an open conversation with him. Um, and I think his actions a while ago, Mr. Speaker, speaks to our relationship. And that is what I speak about, I say, Mr. Speaker, we can have various, we can have varying views. Um, our ideologies on, on, on certain things can be different, Mr. Speaker, but we must agree that before all politics and all structures were there, we were human beings and we're going to deal with each other as human beings. So I'm happy that, that the member for Shuzel, Mr. Speaker, has joined the unity government and has agreed to work with us. And, and we've already started, and Mr. Speaker, we've already... Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I know they say that is there alone, but Mr. Speaker, we've already started the conversation about the future of um, the member for Shuzel and what direction he'll be taking, Mr. Speaker. Anyways, Mr. Speaker, I go to land rationalization and resettlement. And Mr. Speaker, on page 40, um, I look at the anything. I see. You saying anything? <laughs> the member for Castro is. is said, Mr. Speaker, this year the PROUD program will continue to advance the process of land rationalization in the communities of Olion, Olion, Pom, okay, Pom in OG, Opican, Cantonment, Bruceville in Viewfort, and this program aims at empowering the occupants of government own lands in unplanned developments by giving them um, access to fully serviced landlords at affordable prices. And in most of those communities, the cadastral surveys are well advanced and we expect to transfer little, we expect to transfer titles, sorry, to the occupants within the next year. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, on that topic, um, I think it's very important that I mention Volet. Mr. Speaker, we have a situation in Volet where um, we have quite a few persons who are in occupation of Crown Lands for a very long time, Mr. Speaker. It has really um, hampered their development and their ability, Mr. Speaker, to be able to invest properly in the future of their children, Mr. Speaker, because we all know the problems brought about by not having title and deed for your land. And in Volet, we have a situation. And I know that we've started um, the process. Um, the member for Castries Central and his team came down and we started, we were on the ground, Mr. Speaker, and proud. They came down, Mr. Speaker, and ensured that we started the process. I think surveys have started, but I'm hoping, Mr. Speaker, that um, we can move forward with this project and we can see, if not in this financial year, but we can advance the project, Mr. Speaker, and maybe by the next financial year we can conclude and ensure that the people from Volet 2 are 
become occupants or, or, or become title owners, Mr. Speaker, for the lands which they've occupied for many years. We have persons who've been living in these places, Mr. Speaker, for more than six, seven decades, Mr. Speaker, and it's sad that these people are still considered squatters because they do not have titles. So I'm hoping that some consideration is going to be given um, to Volet when we speak about the land rationalization. Also, Mr. Speaker, we have a similar situation in New Extension in Miku, Mr. Speaker. This is a situation that, has, that is of dire concern to the people of New Extension. Although the lands there, Mr. Speaker, are not government-owned, um, but we've started a conversation with the owners of the land, Mr. Speaker, um, because there is no way that you can displace so many people in excess of 300 households, Mr. Speaker, and over 600 people living in that particular area. And uh, as I said earlier, one of the issues plaguing them is their inability to be able to claim title to these lands. P persons are unable to get electricity, water, Mr. Speaker, basic commodities because they do not have access or they do not have title, Mr. Speaker, to the land. So. Um, it is my hope that moving forward we can address this situation and we can bring some relief to the people of New Extension. Mr. Speaker, under commerce and industry, I want to commend the member for Sufre, Mr. Speaker, and the Ministry of Commerce for their policy direction um, <clears throat> and, and for the initiatives that they've decided to take. I see there is, I think, $10 million, Mr. Speaker. Um, in this fiscal year, the government is making available the sum of $10 million for SLDB on the MSME loan grant facility. And Mr. Speaker, one thing I have to commend the Ministry for is for what I ask of the Youth Economy Agency, is that they've taken the opportunities to the people. The Ministry have refused to just set up an office in Castries and expect people to come down, but they've gone to the various communities, um, they've set up business forums within the different communities. I think Mikudnov was the one um, where it was last held, and we could have seen scores of people who came there, Mr. Speaker, and I know that persons made, they applied right there, they had the ability, they brought down everything so that you were able to apply right there, Mr. Speaker. So I think it really helps us in terms of our geographic location. We know some of the disadvantages, some of the difficulties that people have coming from the rural areas and coming into the city. So I applaud the Ministry of Commerce and the member for Sufre, Mr. Speaker, for this initiative. And now, Mr. Speaker, I go to the topic that is most Pressing for the people of Mikud North, Mr. Speaker, agriculture, food security, repair, and maintenance of fishing facilities. Yes, incentives. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, <coughs> usually, usually when I get to that topic, Mr. Speaker, I get to that topic with a heavy heart. Today, Mr. Speaker, I am not, I do not have a heavy heart. I stand here and I'm, I know that. Although um, it was not mentioned in the policy statement, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Prime Minister will ensure that he make mention of it in his rebuttal when he speaks. But today I am pleased to tell the people of Mikud, I am pleased to tell the fishermen of Mikud that this year, this financial year, the jetty is going to be built in Mikud. And Mr. Speaker, this is a very important project for the people of Mikud. And I know that persons both here and abroad have been playing a lot of politics Mr. Speaker, and I want to tell the people of Mikud North, especially the fishermen, Mr. Speaker, that the halt or the delay in the implementation has absolutely nothing to do with the Prime Minister. And I want to make it abundantly clear. I want the records to show, Mr. Speaker, and I believe deep down in my heart, I believe everything that I have, that if left to the Prime Minister alone, that on the 27th of July, I'd have a jetty in Mikud North. I believe that. And I know, Mr. Speaker, I know that he has made every effort and every attempt to ensure that this project is delivered to the people. However, Mr. Speaker, however, and I think sometimes we, we're probably afraid to, to cast blame where we're supposed to cast blame. Because we think probably public servants will say, oh, but how can you stand in the house and you beat us like that? But Mr. Speaker, sometimes we have to say it how it is. And Mr. Speaker, I think implementation, the government comes here, we have to go out there, find the monies to implement projects, and but we are not the, 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 the custodians of these projects. We are not the ones doing the implementation of these projects. We have technical people within the ministries who are charged with the responsibility to ensure that you go ahead with the government's agenda. You implement what the plans and the agenda of the government. And Mr. Speaker, I feel at times there are persons, maybe with political motive or otherwise, Mr. Speaker, maybe 
maybe competencies, I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, who deliberately, and I, and I have to say deliberate, Mr. Speaker, try to find ways to halt the gov certain government projects, Mr. Speaker, who deliberately slow down the implementation of government projects for political gain because your party is not in power, you're, going to, you're not going to um, um, expedite the, the, the initiatives of this government or implement the initiative of this government. And Mr. Speaker, I think that is one of the problems that I've had with, with, with my Miku jetty. Because as I said, I believe left to the Prime Minister alone, I would have had my jetty a very long time. But I commend the Prime Minister for ensuring that this project, because Mr. Speaker, I need to say that, that when the jetty is not built, Mr. Speaker, persons may think, oh, it may affect my political future because this is a big project. But Mr. Speaker, I'm not the one really paying the price, you know. The children of the fishermen, Mr. Speaker, who have to go to school. And I heard the member for um, um, Denry in his presentation spoke about um, fish landings, Mr. Speaker. And he said it was influenced by an improvement in the climatic conditions, couple if a reduction in the amount of sargassum seaweed. We did not have a reduction in sargassum seaweed in Miku North. So whereas other places may have recorded a reduction in seaweed sargassum, Miku, I think what left there came into Miku. That no, what left there came into Miku, Mr. Speaker, and we've spent, and the Prime Minister, I have to commend the, the Prime Minister and member for Cassius East for ensuring, Mr. Speaker, even in the absence of a jetty, that we've been doing remedial works in terms of trying to, to get the... Um, sargassum out of the bay. Mr. Speaker, I know that this is, this is not a measure that can be sustained because of how exhaustive it is, how expensive it is, Mr. Speaker. And we have no direct control over climate change and over the amount of sargassum. So you cannot, Mr. Speaker, you cannot um, continue to sustain that measure of getting heavy equipment to remove sargassum. And I think the real relief is to be able to give the men and women of Mikud North their, their jetty so that their children can go to school. Yes, Mr. Speaker, when I sit in my office, they come to me all the time, you know, Mr. Speaker. No pasale la me, boss man. And I know Kwas, Pope, Paul, and all the, other fellow, all the other men by the sea, Mr. Speaker, all the other fishermen, go big. They can tell Mr. Speaker, they squeeze, you can feel the squeeze. When the guys are able, or when the fishermen are able to go to sea, Mr. Speaker, things running by the sea. You go by the sea and there's always a vibe, there's always life, things running, people selling fish, there's economic activity. But we're going to deliberately do certain things to, to hamper the implementation of the project and think, oh, I'm squeezing Jeremiah, no, but I'm one person. Think of the thousands of persons that you're squeezing by deliberately delaying the implementation of a project. And that's why I say civil servants have a responsibility too. Technocrats have a responsibility too. Do not just put all the blame on government and say, oh, government pa, fessy, government pa. So the government wants to do it. We make the direction, the policy direction of this government clear. We come and we tell you exactly what it is that we're trying to do. However, as I said, the buck stops somewhere with us. We are not the ones going on the ground and, and digging and, and, and putting up the, the buildings. And those persons charged with the responsibility of implementing should do better and should work harder at ensuring that they can implement the projects of the government, Mr. Speaker, and repair of maintenance of fishing facilities. I'm happy because, Mr. Speaker, I came here and I, and I did intend to make serious mention because I think the last time I said it, Mr. Speaker, and you could have heard the passion in my voice, Mr. Speaker, and I was sad at the fact that I heard numerous communities, Mr. Speaker, getting assistance in terms of their, their repair and maintenance of their fishing facilities. So I want to thank the member for Denry South for ensuring that this time, Mr. Speaker, in the policy where it's more important that he has made mention, and I know that we, the people of Miku, we're going to be continuously checking on to see when are we going to be able to get to repair and maintain, and we understand that all cannot happen overnight, Mr. Speaker, but if we do it one step, one step, one step journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step mr speaker and we want to start that journey and we expect the assistance from the member from denry south so i would like to see the fishermen of miku being able to use their facility their washroom facility because they're putting a lot of pressure mr speaker on the um, general washroom facility that we have there and they're going there with the sargassum and all other things mr speaker and it's really putting a strain on the <coughs> washroom facility that is by the sea, but it's a public laundry, and they're using it for things other than public laundry, Mr. Speaker, and it's really putting a strain on the facility. So I'm happy to hear that as part of, of, of agriculture's um, policy direction that they will be giving Mikud North and the facility in Mikud some consideration. I applaud that. Um, infrastructure development and road networks, and I noticed that there was mention of feeder roads. And Mr. Speaker, I know that once upon a time there was talk of dealing with the feeder roads. I think initially the, the conversation was with the QATs 
and that vanished into thin air like so many other things mr speaker that were destroyed however i'm happy to see that this year there will be a focus on feeder roads and i say that mr speaker because the farmers who use the piton road those who go to wyon and especially those in wyon they've been calling on me mr speaker so bald head patch miss Murtul, all of them ah, pa, they're calling on me the road they, they people who really want to assist St. Lucia and the government in meeting this objective of food security, Mr. Speaker, they are unable to do so because they have no access to their farms. They cannot traverse the roads. Not some of the roads, Mr. Speaker, you would think maybe it's not motorable. Some of them you can barely walk, um, and that is because these roads have left have been left unattended for many years after the fall of the banana industry. We've not given or placed any emphasis on this road. So I look forward to the Deep Point Hill, Mr. Speaker. A lot of people are not able to go up Deep Point right now because and we can only use our cdp funds to do this much so i'm hoping that the member for castries north minister of infrastructure is going to really give some consideration to the feeder roads peluge road mr speaker why you piton mine mr speaker there are still farmers who have a genuine interest in farming they really want to assist in terms of helping us meet our objective in meeting food security and Mr. Speaker, these individuals are unable to access their farms because of the, the, the poor conditions of the road. So I'm um, hopeful that this year, Mr. Speaker, the St. Mary Wing Road, Mr. Speaker, this road is critical, Mr. Speaker. And I call on the member for, um, <laughs> and the Lapwit Road as well, Mr. Speaker. We've seen serious undermining of the Lapwit Road, Mr. Speaker. Um, and it is, I'm very fearful, and I say that I'm very fearful at any day, the Lapwit Road. And the Lapwit Road is one way in, one way out. And we need to seriously consider giving some attention to the Lapwit Road to ensure that we don't allow it to get to a point where <clears throat> it's emergency that causes us to attend to the, the situation of the people in Lapwit. So thank you. Thank you very much, Member for um, Miku, Member for <laughs> Castries North. Um, Mr. Speaker, I also want to make mention quickly before my time is up of lights at the wind and passes field. But for the when playing film, Mr. Speaker, I think, although it is not reflected in the policy direction, I have, with my conversation with the member for Grozile, Mr. Speaker, I have been assured that this year that the when playing facility, Mr. Speaker, and this facility, is seen, this is where most cricket is being played, Mr. Speaker, we're going to be seeing lights erected at this facility and proper stands placed at this facility to ensure that persons can now come sit down and enjoy cricket. Cricket is, is the, the, the leading sport. Cricket and football are the leading sport, Mr. Speaker, in Miku North. And I'm happy that the when playing facility has been earmarked to receive some attention this year. I think this is long overdue, especially given what Wayne has been able to produce. We produce quite a few cricketers. We produce a Sean Hill Edward, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the member for Denry North is very happy. We produce Cody Gaston, Mr. Speaker. We produce, um, we produce, yeah, Gary Maffrey. We produce, yeah, quite a few young and budding um, cricketers are coming up from Miku North, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, a uh, key on Gaston as well. And, I'm happy that this is, these are, uh, and the passes playing field, Mr. Speaker, um, although it's under my CDP, I want to assure the people of passes that this year, passes playing field is also going to be lit and we're going to be able to play sports in the night at the passes playing field. I've already started the procurement process. The, the, um, the polls are here, Mr. Speaker. As we speak, the polls are here, they've been paid for, and we're going, and we're moving, we're moving full steam ahead in terms of erecting these lights at passes playing field. And uh, in cemetery expansion, Mr. Speaker, I know that a lot of work has been done as it relates to acquiring the lands, and I think the final process is happening now. And I'm happy to know that <coughs> the government is going to be placing some emphasis on ensuring that the much needed cemetery in Monrepo and Mikud, Mr. Speaker, is going to be addressed this year. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, in closing, I want to thank the people of Mikud North. I want to thank the people of Mikunov once again, Mr. Speaker, and I want to tell them to look out for some of these projects which will be happening in the constituency this year. And I want to also encourage them, Mr. Speaker, to make the most of the numerous opportunities which I have spoken about during my presentation. I look forward to working even closer with my constituents this year, Mr. Speaker, as we make Mikunov the envy of other constituencies. I want to also thank the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, and my parliamentary colleagues for providing me with the necessary guidance and assistance during my first 18 months in government. 
and I look forward and I want to thank the member for Chosel, Mr. Speaker, for being very friendly to me during the first 18 months. And I look forward to even greater things this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.